dengan heavy duty gas turbin yang pakai slip tapi um, uh, agak le- lebih mudah karena uh, shaftnya tidak seberat heavy duty gas turbin tapi yang menjadi kendala di sini kita harus uh, biasanya melakukan slow uh, slow rotating um, supaya bisa airflow masuk nah itu semua harus direktify dalam 10 menit kalau misalnya dalam 10 menit kita tidak bisa rectify, itu biasanya masuk cycle for hours lockout. Artinya um, uh, gas turbin tidak dapat diproseskan dalam 4 jam. Kalau misalnya dalam 10 menit awal itu tidak bisa direktify. Sampai situ ada um, pertanyaan, komen, concern dari Bapak-Bapak. Tidak ada ya. Baik, kalau tidak ada, kita lanjut saja. Oke, John, you may, you may proceed with the... Oke. Okay. Right. Right. So on the front cover of your book, or your material, this is the layout of the package. This is what it'll look like once it's set up. You'll hear a term the generation of the package. What you have is a Gen 4 configuration, which is what you're looking at here in this illustration. This is the way it's going to be laid out. You have your uh, air filter coming in here. This is where the air comes into the turbine. You have your main turbine assembly in this enclosure here. And then you have your generator assembly on the tail end of the uh, the unit, uh, you have several trailers put together comprising one for the turbine, one for the generator, and one for the air filter house. This right here is your exhaust system coming out. It comes out to the side of the turbine and then up. And then on the opposite side of the turbine package, you'll have an auxiliary skid. This will have your liquid fuel and your water boost pumps located on it. Also have your uh, fuel filters. Uh, located on here, and then you have your uh, control room. Uh, this is where your local control station is going to be located here, uh, but this will be what's controlling the, the turbine. In your case, what you have on this package is going to be a Woodward Micronet control system. Some of the newer packages we have out, we're currently running a Gen 8 configuration. It's using a different controller called RX3i. I don't want to confuse you with anything in regards to it. Uh, the package is laid out a little bit different, uh, but you have all the same components, just the newer generations. The main thing is they uh, designed them to make it a little bit more easier for transportation purposes and change up some of the configuration profile. Uh, I like your layout better and that your control system is inside of this control room here and it's in a more protected environment. So you have a big advantage over some of the newer systems. You have a more of a, a protected feature than what they have with some of the other systems. Uh, it will create a couple extra problems for you the way it's laid out through here, but I'll show you what we can look for and things that you can do during daily walk around, check and inspection to make sure that uh, everything's uh, okay and that you don't run into these problems, but they're simple things to spot just to keep an eye on. But other than that, you have a better configuration for the way this is laid out through here. All right. First thing we want to kind to look at in regards to turbines, and you probably heard this with steam turbines and with uh, the heavy duty uh, type turbines, you heard the term FOD and DOD. FOD is foreign object damage, and then you have what they call DOD, domestic object damage. Okay. Foreign object damage is something that's sucked into the turbine. That's not part of the turbine structure itself. Uh, possibly somehow it got past the filtration system. 
made its way into the intake of the turbine and creates catastrophic damage to the turbine itself. Okay. DOD or domestic object damage, this is something that's caused by the system itself. You may have a breakdown in the filtration system or you may have a blade that gets damaged. Uh, somehow the, a piece comes loose, it goes through. Uh, anything inside the flow path of the air through the turbine has a possibility of doing major, major damage to the compressor sections, the power turbine sections, and the rest of the turbine causing a complete failure with the system. So there's several precautionary measures that we've taken with the air filtration system, minimizing the effect of foreign object damage, uh, domestic object damage. That's going to depend more on you as operators, how well you're looking and doing your routine checks inspections on the unit. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't worry about any kind of DOD uh, type damage. I'll show you a little bit of what we're looking at. I'll come back to that in just a second. Okay. This right here is showing a high pressure compressor casing. Uh, like I said, something like this could have been happened from foreign object damage, something being ingested by a turbine and it coming through damaging all the blades. It could have been from an actual blade that might have let loose on the turbine. And that too is also being drawn into the turbine and hitting across all the rotating uh, components causing major catastrophic damage. So what you're looking at here, the indicator down here says FOD can be anywhere. Okay, Damage like this can occur from foreign object damage, but it can also occur from domestic object damage. Like I said, an internal failure, uh, something happened with the filtration system. We suck past the inlet filter. It gets past the uh, sorry, I was letting somebody in. Uh, getting past uh, the intake coming into the turbine, like I said, any little minute thing coming through there, our tolerances are so tight on the engine, it's not going to be very forgiving, and more than likely, it'll do major damage, something what you're looking at here. And this, this could be a result of both foreign object damage or domestic object, object damage. Now, what you're looking at here, this was just an example of damage to a turbine. This is a something you can see more in line with a heavy duty type uh, inner core. Same thing here, this engine in the water through here. This is, <laughs> this is something totally different from foreign object damage. This is where we had one fall off a truck going across a bridge. Uh, they didn't have it balanced right, fell into the to the river uh, through here. That doesn't have anything to do with package configuration or anything else like that. It's just damage to the engine. Aircraft are a little bit more susceptible to foreign object damage in the fact that their intake of the turbines are wide open to the atmosphere and they have no protection across the intakes on the turbine, as you can see here on the pods containing the, the engines uh, below the wing on, a, on an aircraft. Here they've sucked an actual cargo, uh, you know, with the luggage and stuff comes in. One of the cargo containers got sucked up inside the uh, turbine. This would be foreign object damage, okay? But like I said, domestic object damage is gonna come from something within the turbine itself causing the, the damage. Now backing up, didn't mean to jump into that quite like that. Some of the things that we need to be concerned with in dealing with the turbine as far as safety measures through here, you've worked around other things, you've worked around steam turbines, you've worked around heavy duty turbines, and you know there's going to be hot surfaces, there's going to be uh, oil that's going to be under high pressure. 
there's going to be fuel under high pressure. We're dealing with temperatures. We're doing dealing with several different type of common uh, safety issues that you're going to see around any type of plant through here. So a lot of it's just common sense. You got to wear your proper PPE. You want to wear your safety glasses at all times. You want to wear gloves. Uh, if what you're doing requires some uh, special handling purposes, like some of the chemicals that we're using for, say, water wash or the urban lube oil, especially, uh, these can be toxic and cause some skin irritation, and they can also cause some very severe uh, safety risk as well. The oil system, for what you have on your system, you're going to have three types of oil. You're going to have mineral lube oil, which we use for the generator application. Uh, it gives us a little bit better viscosity. We're not running the high temperatures that we're running in the turbine. And so mineral lube oil is a better component for the general type variants that we're running in the generator. Okay. The turbine's a little bit different. Turbines run in higher temperatures. We do not have any journals in the turbine itself. It's all roller or ball bearing. So we have frictionless type bearings, run extreme high temperatures. And because of this, we're running a synthetic lube oil. Synthetic lube oil gives us a better viscosity and lubrication uh, characteristics at higher temperatures. Okay. The problem you have with the turbine lube oil is it's a synthetic oil and it's a neurotoxin. So you don't want to be breathing fumes. You don't want to be getting it on your skin. You don't want to get it in your eyes or anything through there. So a lot of times when you're handling the PPE, you're going to be wearing uh, gloves and stuff to handle the, uh, the filling lines, things like that. You don't want to get it on your skin. There are going to be repairs that you're making that will require you or will cause the turbine lube oil to get on your bare hands and things like that. Uh, wipe it off. Have clean gloves or have something handy that you can uh, clean your hands off with uh, fairly quickly. Don't be wiping up on your coveralls or your jeans or whatever your uh, uniform that you're wearing uh, on the site through here. You have oil on your personal clothing and things like that. It will still be able to absorb into your skin. Like I said, it's a neurotoxin, so it's not something you want to, you know, if you get out there and you get sprayed down because you have an oil leak or something like that, or you're making repair and you get oil all over yourself, you do want to take proper precautions. You possibly need to change, may change out your coveralls and stuff just to get the oil uh off and away from your skin. It's not going to cause damage quickly or anything else like that. You probably won't notice anything other than that you got oil on you. Uh, but it is something that soaks into your skin. It gets into your nervous system. And once it's in your nervous system, it's not something you can easily get out. It's something that starts building up over years of exposure. And the longer you're exposed to it and not taking any kind of precautionary measures, uh, it can cause some long-term uh, health issues. So be careful with the, the oils that you're using on the system. The hydraulic start system is a third oil system that you use. It's a small oil system. It's a kind of a standalone type uh, system. You got a tank, a tank heaters, filtration, all the things that you do, all the other tanks. Uh, the oil that we use for the hydraulic oil doesn't have the toxicity that the synthetic oil that it's used in the turbine has. The problem that we have around the hydraulic start system, and I'll point this out as we get more into detail on that system, is that this system runs under a high pressure. You're looking at about 5,400 PSI of pressure coming off this, this unit. So we're dealing with a very, very high pressure. You don't want to be around the system uh, when it's pressurized. And you definitely don't want to be inside the enclosure when this thing's pressurized up. This is one of the 
higher pressure lines or higher risk lines that we have to deal with will be the hydraulic storage system. So you have three different types of oil. You got mineral oil for the generator, synthetic oil for the turbine, and then a hydraulic oil that we use for the hydraulic star system. All the oils that we have on the system and the fluids that we use for water wash can be environmental uh, concerns to us. So I'm sure being in a plant through here, it's not you're just going to dump stuff off on the ground through there. It's going to waste oil or water uh, collection systems through there. It has to be dealt with properly according to your guidelines there in the country where uh, these units are being operated at. Uh, but like I said, this gets into the water system. The uh, synthetic oils can be of a uh, toxic uh, issue to the fish. The mineral oil can also cause environmental issues as well. Uh, another uh, big safety concern is the cleaning solvents that we use for the uh, uh, the water wash systems on the units. Uh, you have a water wash tank will will mix demineralized water with a solvent solution uh, for doing online and offline water wash on the units, and we can't just let these pour out or go you know onto the ground or anything. These can also cause some um, environmental issues and stuff. So all the fluids off here will go to a drain collection system, and like I said. That will be all the responsibility to deal with the collected uh, fuel, uh, solvent water, whatever is being contained off the system. But these have to be handled properly and not just dumped anywhere because they can cause some environmental uh, issues. Fires on the systems, we haven't had big issues with these, but uh, most of the fires, in fact, all the fires I can say are probably been more from negligence, uh, not following certain safety guidelines. Uh, one of the fires, something similar to what you're seeing with this one right here. Uh, we had a fire situation where a unit was sitting there. It was about 95% ready for doing its first fire. It was all ready to go. The only thing that they were waiting on was for a natural gas line to be finalized and pulled into the plant so they could purge the system and then get natural gas to the gas uh, turbine. So they were waiting on that. They were getting kind of bored waiting for the gas line to get bought into the plant facility. And in the meantime, they decided they were going to weld some halogen floodlights on the outside of the enclosure to better allow the operators as they're doing night inspections to have better visibility, which was fine, but they put uh, uh, they started putting the fixtures up on the filter house. The filter house was already loaded with filter media, and they didn't have a spotter on the inside of the filter house looking for any possible uh, slag or anything you know, coming through the metal. And they actually had a burn through when they were doing the welding onto the, uh, the side panel of the filter house it caught the filter house on fire and they were able to salvage the engine but they had to do a lot of rewiring and had to completely replace the uh, filter house assembly uh, on top of a particular unit in the case here what you're looking at is an lm6000 it's the big sister to the lm2500 that you have in this case in this particular incident what had happened they didn't the subcontractor or the contractor, GE was a subcontractor here. The main contractor installed the gas vent lines in an improper location, and GE refused to start the unit until the vent lines were relocated. GE was off site. The main contractor wanted to meet a 
contract requirement and get an earlier first fire start on the unit. So without moving the vent lines, they went ahead and uh, try to start the unit. When they purged the gas, the gas was sucked into the filtration house and they had ignition on the gas. It went all the way up into the filter house and it basically blew the side doors off the enclosure. So it was a major catastrophic failure in this situation. On this one over here, again, they were doing something. Uh, somebody was up there around the unit and they were smoking. You're not supposed to be smoking around this. You shouldn't be smoking around the package anyway or within the plant through here. And uh, they were changing filters out and they caught the filter house on fire. Again, the, uh, the media inside of these things is very flammable very dry through here. And like I said, you get any kind of flame source or to that, then you have a, a high risk of a, a flame occurrence through here. The problem you have on something on the outside through here is we don't have fire retardant capabilities for the exterior through here. We do have fire protection inside the uh, enclosures on the package generator and the turbine enclosures around the auxiliary skids and the uh, control room uh, access piece to it. We have all fire protection capabilities and monitoring equipment, but if something happens external to the unit, uh, we don't have anything up in these areas for fire suppression. So it's going to be very hard to maintain control of this without affecting the, the rest of the package through there. It's kind of an over, you know, I don't see anything like this around your package, of course. However, the way that your package is laid out, you do have a lot of umbilical cables running from uh, auxiliary electrical cabinets on the side of the main skid coming over to the main unit. Kind of like on your cover. This area through here, there's some junction boxes through here that you have these big umbilical cables coming over and connecting to the control house over here. Everything's already pre-wired on your skids through here. Everything's pre-wired through here on your aux skids and into your control room uh, piece through here. The only thing that we're doing is running instrumentation and power feeds over from here coming over to here. And so you have to be careful when you're walking through here not to be stepping on any electrical cables or things like that. So uh, again, a lot of this is just common sense. You want to be walking on the lines so you want to protect them. You've worked with the steam turbines or the heavy duties. You'll know that the GE has what they refer to as their GEK manuals for the engines on how to properly handle uh, the engines for removal or doing repairs, things like that. Uh, in the case here, what happened? They didn't have it balanced right. They didn't have it secured properly on the uh, the overhead piece for the I beam and the hoist piece let loose and this thing dropped out of the package, which that's that's a major dollar repair job on something like that. You're gonna have damaged the engine, the casing through here. Uh, this thing had to be replaced uh, through here. And the DLE, so this is probably one of your more expensive configuration engines through here, but you have within the GEK manual, uh, all of the procedures that you need for engine removal, component removal on the system. We want to use the proper tooling and we want to abide by the correct hoist and lifting locations if we're having to 
been as extreme as uh, taking the engine out of the uh, the package through here. We need to follow the uh, the proper procedures through here and making sure that everything goes accordingly as planned through here and use the proper uh, equipment pieces through here. And like I said, what happened here is uh, it wasn't balanced right. They didn't have the, the H beam support piece set up right and the guide rail piece. They had an issue with it and the chain hoist let loose with it. It fell. Here it's just kind of showing an overkill on. You're never going to come up to something like this with a hand pump through here or use these types of. Here we're trying to get a screw off. You're going to use a screwdriver. You're not going to use a pair of pliers. Okay. The point that it's trying to make here is that you have proper tooling. And again, in the GEK, if you haven't seen them before, uh, something that we'll look at if you're part of the maintenance class next week, we'll go into very much or high detail on uh, the tooling requirements uh, for your package. You have to use the proper tools. Uh, I don't want to do anything that's going to booger up the any components like here that's going to cause damage to that screw head piece through there, which may damage it from being uh, able to be taken off later on with a proper uh, screwdriver, what you have to do there. But the main thing is use the proper tooling. Okay. Something that should come with a package, I believe, for any type of package that GE uh, puts out to the customer, that you will have the level one tooling to be able to do most of your level one uh, instrumentation repairs, like your speed sensors, your pressure transmitters, uh, temperature probes, things like that. Uh, you will have the proper tooling, the uh, depth gauges, things like that you need for set gap distance, things like that, and the torque range. Okay. Everything within the GEK procedures will have a special torque requirement. A lot of times people will get in there and they will over torque a lot of the bolts if they've done like a casing with taking the casing cover off the turbine. Uh, they'll go back in and they think, well, the tighter the better, and that's not the case. This is an aircraft engine, and so it goes through a lot of thermal expansion. And so it was designed to be a little bit loose. And if I over torque it, what's going to happen is the bolts are designed for breakage at certain stress points. And you have three different types of bolts. You have one that's going to break very easy one that has a little bit stronger foothold to it, and then you have one that has a higher uh, torque strength to it. And what you'll notice like on say, a casing uh, split, you'll see it on the side of any of the, the aero derivative turbines, is you'll see three or four of the smaller bolts, then you'll see a medium size nut and bolt assembly, and then you'll see a larger one that will be uh, almost twice or three times the size of the other bolts through there with a compression collar on it. What this allows, if you had some extreme expansion that occur, thermal expansion occur on the engine, the smaller bolts would break, but the medium torqued bolt would hold the engine in place. If you had a severe expansion, uh, or increase in size of the casing through there, then the middle bolt would snap and then the longer bolts would compress the compression collars and still hold the the turbine together into one piece. They don't want the turbine to come apart. And so like I said, torque is very important on all of the components on the turbine. If you over torque it, it doesn't make it better. Okay, you want to use the proper torque because if you over torque them, when you go inside the turbine enclosure after it's been running, everything may be OK, but you're going to see broken bolts laying around on the bottom of the uh, enclosure uh, piece through there, and that's because they were over to begin with. So proper torquing, the, you know, you have to go by what the GEK manual uh, 
provides for us. But the main thing is use the proper tool. I'm sorry. Uh, on hearing protection, uh, if the if you're around the engine uh, and it's operating, uh, you typically want to wear uh, double uh, hearing protection. Uh, in a lot of cases, and something that we'll point out when we get to the hydraulic start system. The hydraulic start system, you have to uh, do some visual inspections on some differential filters, uh, indicators on the uh, filters, the oil filter going into the hydraulic start system. And they're not instrumentated back to the operator control panel. This is one of the things that I've been advocating to have done for years, and it's still not. They consider it a system that's only used temporarily, you know, to start the unit or for motoring, for water wash, things like that, for service. So the thing, the hydraulic start system isn't on for a long period of time. So it's something that they feel can be easily Repairs made while the unit's operating that won't affect anything as far as the unit running. The problem with that is the hydraulic start system, as I'd mentioned before, this has a very high output pressure uh, for going to the starter motor inside the turbine enclosure. You're looking at 5,400 PSI. And to get up around these filters where the oil flow is going to the main primary filter or the pump going to the starter, you're having to get down in that area, get your face kind of down to look at the indicators. And to me, that's not a very safe practice, but it's like I said, we'll, we'll see how you need to go about approaching that as we get into the hydraulic star system. But always use eye protection. When the unit's running and you're doing your walk arounds on the unit, if the unit's running while you're doing walk arounds and checks, always use your uh, double hearing protection. Under no circumstance do you need to go inside the package while it's operating at loaded conditions. However, there may be times when you're working on the system, maybe you had a turbine lube oil pump failure. You've replaced the pump assembly. It's a mechanical pump. And so we do have to look to make sure that there's no oil leaks. You do have the capability to prop the engine doors open, latch them back in place. You only want to bring the engine up to core idle. I don't want to go past core idle. Okay. Take a look at what's going on. Once you've observed what needs to be observed, then you want to have the observer close the doors, seal the compartment back off, and uh, reactivate the fire suppression system. Okay. Anytime the doors are open, you typically have to isolate the fire protection system, and that creates a higher risk not only for personnel, but for the uh, equipment itself. So, like I said, there are going to be times you need to go in. Like I said, you're, you've done some repairs, you're checking for leaks. It should be a quick check, but you don't want to go inside the package. You can look from the doorway, you can see what you need to see. It's a small enclosure. Okay. So, you're going to be able to see leaks and checks for things like that. If corrective actions need to be taken, you do not want to go inside the package while it's running. You want to go ahead and shut the unit down. Do your proper lotto, lockout, tag out requirements, and then go in and do the service. Don't try to do it while the unit's uh, operating or anything else like that. Like I said, like I said, sometimes it's necessary while it's at a idle speed to make some checks, but it should be a very short term temporary thing, not something that you go in, open the doors, especially while it's in full operational mode. Okay. If 
it's up and running faster than chloride all year at a very high uh, safety risk and nobody 